Praise the Lord. Let's close our eyes for prayer. Our Father, we thank you because you brought us together. We are praying, Lord, you equip all your ministers, all the Christian soldiers, all the Christian warriors, and we will do what you want us to do in Jesus' name. Lord, we pray we will be covered in the blood of the Lamb, with the sword of the Spirit in our hands, the word of God coming out of our mouth, or the shield of faith, and all the armor we put on, we shall not be defeated in Jesus' name. We pray, Lord, as you are bringing us higher and higher every day. All the ministers here, representing different churches, you will do such great work in every heart and life that has to bring us up, lift us up. The devil will never puncture our tire again in Jesus' name. Will never bring us down. Will move from strength to strength. Grace to grace. Glory to glory. From one level of victory to another level of victory. Thank you, Lord, because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. We're still in our series, the Ephesians series. And we are in Ephesians chapter 6. And if you remember, we'll be talking about the armor of God. In Ephesians 6 verse 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. There we are commanded to put on the whole armor of God. And we'll be considering the pieces of that armor. Verse 14, stand therefore. Having your loins got about with truth. Having on the best pledge of righteousness. There you have the girdle of truth. The belt of truth. We've considered that. Then you have the best pledge of righteousness. We've considered that. In verse 15. And your feet short with the preparation of the gospel of peace. The shoes of the gospel of peace. We have considered that also. Above all, taking the shield of faith. Wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. We have considered that also the shield of faith. And take the helmet of salvation. That we have considered. Now we come to the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. That's what we're considering now. The sword of the spirit. You know it already. That God desires you to have victory and you are going to have it. He desires every Christian and every minister to win in their battle against Satan. And against all the agents of the evil one. And he has made adequate provision for our victory in the battle that is raging. No matter the strategy, no matter the agent used by the devil in any battle, at any place, at any time, the Christian soldier who puts on the whole armor of God and he trains himself to use every piece of the armor effectively will win. The victory. We can be conquerors. I said we can be conquerors. Indeed, we can be more than conquerors in our spiritual warfare against Satan. Warfare against sin. Warfare against all the works of the enemy. The pieces of armor provided for the Roman soldier are both defensive and offensive weapons. What are defensive weapons? Defensive weapons are given to watch off the attacks which come from the evil one. What are the offensive weapons? Offensive weapons attack the enemy so that we're able to put the enemy on the run. That is to make him flee. We have strong, impenetrable, defensive armor as well as powerful, mighty, unfailing, offensive armor. And we shall be victorious if we use all these weapons provided for us in God's word. As we come to consider this today, the sword of the spirit, we're dividing the message to three parts. Number one, the description of the sword of the spirit. The description 
of the sword of the spirit. Number two, the discipline of learning to use the sword. The discipline of learning to use the sword. Number three, defeating Satan with the sword of the spirit. Defeating Satan with the sword of the spirit. Come back to number one, the description of the sword of the spirit. As you come back to Ephesians chapter 6, verse 17, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. I told you yesterday that Paul the apostle at this time was between two soldiers, Roman soldiers, because he was in the prison. Looking at them, he recollected the uniform and also the equipment and the armor, the weapons that these Roman soldiers had in conquering the enemy. Because the Roman soldier at that time was a mighty, powerful army. And they actually defeated, put on their own, every enemy. And then he began to think, as the Lord helped him in meditating on the life and the race and the warfare and the battle and the conflict of the Christian, of the believer and of the minister. And he now saw, and he transferred from the known to the unknown, from the physical to the spiritual, from the kingdom of this world to the kingdom of God. From those who are fighting flesh and blood to those who are fighting principalities and powers. And you realize something. That we too, we must put on the whole armor of God if we are going to overcome, if we are going to succeed. And then you realize one of the weapons that the Roman soldier had was the sword. And it was an offensive weapon. The sword to which Paul refers here in the original language was a Roman soldier sword which varied in length from 6 inches to 18 inches one half feet. It was a common sword carried by Roman foot soldiers and it was the principal weapon in hand-to-hand -hand combat carried in its sheath or scabbard attached to their bells. It was always at hand and ready for use. But the soldier then, the soldier of Christ, or the Christian minister, ours is the sword, but not the physical sword made of metal, is the sword of the spirit. We are engaged in a spiritual warfare. So we can only use spiritual weapon. Please understand that. Natural people in natural combat use natural weapons. And physical people with physical, tangible, visible battle, they use physical, natural, physical, um, visible, a kind of weapon. But when you come to spiritual weapon, you use that because you are in a spiritual battle. The nature destroys. The source of our sword is the spirit. That's why it says it's the sword belonging to the spirit, to the Holy Spirit. The sword of the spirit. If you have time, and you should have time, you go through your concordance and find every time the word and the sword, the word and the spirit, the word, the scripture, and the spirit that they are joined together. The word of God. The spirit of God. The sword of the spirit. That the believer, the minister, will wield. So that he will be able to overcome and defeat the enemy at every turn, in every battle. Come with me. The word of God is the sword of the spirit. Our sword is of divine origin. And it's of divine power. That's why it conquers the devil, disturbs the devil, and puts the devil on the run. The sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, is living and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. Look at it. In Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4. Verse 12. 
For the watch of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of the soul and of the spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is the discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. That's the sword of the spirit, the word of God, quick, powerful, mighty, piercing, dividing asunder, defeating the enemy. The sword is the most dreaded weapon that we can use against the enemy. But I have told you already that it's different from the sword that the Roman soldier was carrying about. A metal sword can only pierce the body, but the sword of the spirit will pierce the spirit of man and even pierce the spirits roaming about anywhere. A metal sword gets dull as we use it, but the sword of the spirit is sharpened with use. You know those Roman soldiers who carry the metal sword, they need to practice how to use that sword to be very effective. And it's the same way that those of us who are soldiers of Christ, ministers of the gospel, Christian warriors, we need to practice the sword, the use of the sword of the spirit, the word of God, so that you'll be able to skillfully use that thing when you are well trained as soldiers, Christian soldiers. That's the only way you can defeat Satan. And all his agents that are fighting against you, fighting against your ministry, fighting against the church of the living God. Again, upon this rock, I build my church. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. The sword, Jesus used it. In fact, as we see Jesus Christ revealing himself unto John the Beloved, in the Isle of Patmos, see, see the way it says it in Revelation chapter 1. Revelation chapter 1, verse 16. And he had in his right hand seven stars by the way that refers to the churches. He's holding the churches. And from the picture here, from the things that they said about the stars here, you understand what the Lord wants the church to be. To be shining light without darkness at all. He wants the church to be the shining light without the darkness of sin. The darkness of idolatry. The darkness of occultism. The darkness of evil, secret, occultic power. Without the darkness of something they do behind the curtain that the public must not see. It says, he that has in his right hand the seven stars and seven there is a number for completeness. It's talking about the whole church, whatever the denomination. That the church, complete church, all the churches, there's the will of the Lord, the desire of the Lord, the plan of the Lord, the program of the Lord. That those churches will be like bright, shiny stars. And then out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. That's the word. That's the word. And he is the word personified. In the beginning was the word. And the word was with God and the word was God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father. Full of grace and full of truth. Therefore we understand what it says. Out of his mouth went forth a sharp two-edged sword. That's what we're talking about. Take that sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. And then it says his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. It is still in Revelation chapter 2. Revelation chapter 2 reading from verse 12. And to the angel of the church in Pagamos write, These things says he, which has the sharp sword with two edges. And you will see as, as you picture Christ. Uh, the, the, the picture is that he has the sharp two-edged sword. But uh, do you realize something? Come back to chapter 1 verse 16. Chapter 1 verse 16. The Roman soldier held 
The son's sword was the hand. But where does the Lord, the commander in chief, the captain of our salvation, where does he have his own sword? Is he holding his own sword or the hand? Look at it. Chapter 1, verse 16. And he and he had in his right hand the seven stars. And out of out of where? Out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. That already tells you that the sharp edged sword is a spoken word. It's coming out of his mouth. Out of his mouth. Out of his mouth. Then we come back to chapter 2. Verse 12. This thing says he which has the sharp sword or two edges. I know thy works and where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seat is, and thou holdest fast my name, and hast not denied my faith. Even in those days wherein Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was slain among you, where Satan dwelleth. But I have a few things against you, because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balaam to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed unto idols, and to commit fornication. So hast thou also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. Look at verse 16, very important, and see the use of a sword. Repent, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will, will do what? Say it out loud. And will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. Again, you understand? It is a spoken word. That sword is coming out of his mouth. And it is the word in chapter 19 of Revelation. Revelation chapter 19, verse 15. And out of his mouth, you see that goes a sharp sword. With that, that with it, it shall smite the nations, smite the nations, fight the nations, do combat with the nations, or that sword coming out of the mouth, and it shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the wine press of the fierceness and the wrath of the Almighty God. Verse 13, and it was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. And his name is called the Word of God. So then you see that it is that correlation. The description of the search of the Spirit. It is the Word. Point number two. The discipline of learning to use the sword. The discipline of learning to use the sword. Uh, you see, if we are real soldiers, you don't just get into the army the, the first day and then you're able to use the sword effectively. These Roman soldiers went through some training. And we need to get ourselves trained so that we can use the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God, effectively against the enemy of our soul, against the devil. First Chronicles chapter 5. First Chronicles chapter 5. Reading from verse 18. First Chronicles 5, 18. The sons of Reuben and the Gadites and of the tribe of Manasseh, of valiant men, men able to bear the buckler and sword and to shoot with bow and skillful in war. Why? Four and forty thousand seven hundred and three score that went out to the wall. You see here they were skillful. That takes training. They learned to use the buckler, the shield, and also the the sword. They learned to choose uh, to shoot the arrow against the targets, against the enemies. Verse nineteen, and they made war with the Hagarites. And then it goes on to verse twenty, and they were helped against them. And the Hagarites were delivered into their hands. 
and all that were with them for they cried to God in the battle and he was entreated of them because they put their trust in him they prayed they relied on the Lord but they were also skillful they learned how to use the sword in the same thing with us ministers when temptations come learn to use that sword when attacks come from the enemy learn to use that sword and when confusion comes in the ministry learn to use that sword when questions arise in your mind kind the kind of questions that can destabilize you destabilize the ministry ruin the ministry go back to the armory pick up that sword learn to use the sword of the spirit the discipline to learn of learning how to use the sword and you know in genesis chapter 14 genesis chapter 14 abraham had some uh, some servants that he trained and he trained them to be able to fight fight when complete battle arose in genesis chapter 14 verse 14 when abram heard that his brother that's lord was taking captive he armed his trained servants born in his own house 318 and pursued them unto Dan and that means then that when you have these weapons the belt of truth the breastplate of righteousness the helmet of salvation the shoe of the gospel of peace and the shield of faith and now the sword of the spirit train yourself train yourself to be able to effectively use that armor against the enemy of your soul and the enemy of your ministry in verse 15 and he divided himself against them he and his servants by night and smote them and pursued them unto Hoba, which is on the left hand of damascus when he said he smote them it tells us something there they were using the sword and he used the sword effectively and he defeated the enemy we come to the new testament in hebrews chapter 5 we need to be skillful well trained in the use of the pieces of the armor so that we will not have the armor in hand and then just uh, you know just like that we will not to use the armor and of course with every bit of the armor we are also vigilant. In one of the battles of Alexander the Great, Alexander the Great was actually a mighty, mighty warrior. And if you have read about Alexander the Great, he was the first emperor called the Great. They attached those two words to his name, Alexander the Great. And the reason is because he just conquered the, the known world at that time and unified the whole world at that time and even propagated the greek language but he was in a battle and the and the enemy side they were fighting and i think i told you already that at that time they used the sword very much and as they were fighting and there was somebody wanting to just kill uh, alexander the great and he wanted to thrust the sword at him but the very assistant to alexander the great he was behind him while he lifted up the sword like this the assistant of alexander the great from behind used his own sword cut off his hand that's how the life of alexander the great at that time was saved you see that other man he had the sword but he wasn't vigilant and he knew how to use the sword but he wasn't vigilant he didn't know there was another person on the side of alexander the great that just appeared cut off his hand and then they killed him and, and that's how you know they defeated that that enemy the, the, the army we need to be very skillful in using the sword of the spirit and we need to be vigilant as well hebrews chapter 5 verses 13 and 14 hebrews 5 13 for everyone that uses the milk is so skillful in the word of righteousness for he is a babe we who are ministers of the gospel we must not be like babes 
Uh, the only thing we'll read is John. When we'll read John 3.16, then we'll read John 10.10, 10, and then we'll read John 10.27, and then maybe we'll read uh, Romans chapter 5, and maybe we'll read maybe Matthew chapter 28, and we'll read some, you know, simple, simple passages. We're not skillful in the word. But we avoid books like Jeremiah and Isaiah and Ezekiel and Hosea and the minor prophets and you know all those uh, books that have some rich, rich, deep, deep uh, prophetic uh, things because we're not skillful in the world. But if we're going to be able to overcome, overcome the devil at every turn, in every place, you get to the world and you study until you're able to use the sword of the spirit skillfully and effectively in verse 14. But strong meat belongeth to them that are full age, even to those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Become so skillful to be able to use the word effectively. Uh, let, let's come back to Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 16. And just reminding ourselves once again. That one of the pieces of armor, the one we're studying now, is the, the sword of the spirit. And it tells us what that sword is. The sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. The term word. There are two Greek words, translated word, in the New Testament. The first is logos. The word logos is a common word that they normally use for to translate to word. And logos refers to the general statements, general message, the whole watch of God, everything. But there's another word that is uh, used, that is uh, translated word, and it's rhema, which actually means an individual word or particular statement. And the sword of the spirit here, according to the original, is the word rhema, the rhema of God. So you read it like this, Take the helmet of salvation and take the sword of the spirit, which is the rhema, the particular word appropriate for the specific situation in which you are, the rhema of God. And like Jesus did in the wilderness, we need to use specific scriptural truth to counter specific satanic attack and falsehood. We need to learn and train ourselves to use the sword of the spirit effectively. The Bible is like an armory. And inside you have all sorts of swords. Rhema. This word, when you're sick, there is a word that is appropriate. When there is affliction, there's another word that's appropriate. When there's confusion in your mind, there is another word that's appropriate. When there is discouragement, there is another word that is appropriate. And when there is opposition in the ministry, there is another word that is appropriate. When you are fearful, there is another word that is appropriate. When you are to preach salvation, there is another word that is appropriate. When you are teaching the church to build the church, edify the church, there is another word that is appropriate. When there is division in the church, and God wants to use you to quench that division, that dart of division, vision coming from the enemy there's another word that's appropriate so but you, you look at the whole bible because inside that bible you have all sorts of swords that you can pull out when you need to attack the enemy and put him to flight and that's why a uh, one scottish pastor and writer thomas guthrie he said the bible is armory of heavenly weapons and it's a laboratory of infallible medicines. It's a mine of exhaustless wealth. He said, it's a guidebook for every road, a charge for every sea, a medicine for every malady, a balm for every wound. He said, rob me of my Bible, and my sky will lose its sun, its shining. Rob us of our Bible, and then the warrior will lose its victory. The word of God is the source of victory over the great enemy of our soul, a spiritual enemy. 
And this word of God is our most powerful weapon against Satan, against sin, and against all the oppressions of the devil. That's why you say you need to discipline yourself to learn how to use the sword of the spirit, the word of God. In Second Timothy chapter two. Second Timothy chapter two. Verse 15. Study to show yourself a preach unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. He was talking to Timothy, his son in the faith, and he ministered the pastor in the church in Ephesus. He said, Timothy, you know what to do? Study to show yourself approved unto God. Endeavor to show yourself approved unto God. Discipline yourself to learn the word. And to know to use that sword of the spirit to defend yourself, to defend your ministry, to defend the church, to defend the church against the onslaught of the enemy. But Timothy, it will not come automatically just because you are appointed or doing or put into that church there. You are going to do something. Make an effort. Do something about it. Study to show yourself approved unto God. A workman that needs not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the watch of truth. And of course, if, if you know that the Spirit of God works with the truth of the Scripture, you are going to pray that you have more of the Spirit of God in your life. So that the Spirit of God will help you. He's the author. He's the one that inspired this word. Will help you to be able to use the word effectively. In John, Chapter 15, verse 26. John 15, 26. But when the Comforter has come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth, which proceedeth from the Father, he shall testify of me. The Spirit of truth. Not the Spirit of shaking. The Spirit of truth. Not the spirit of falling this lane. The spirit of truth. It's not just to speak in tongues. You know, our Pentecostal brothers, ministers, they have missed the point. They think that when the Holy Spirit comes from you, the greatest thing the Holy Spirit does in your life in ministry is to help you talk in tongues in a language you have not learned. If you see the embassies of Jesus Christ, Every time he referred to the Holy Spirit, when talking to his own disciples, that they should wait until that Spirit of God will come upon them. You know the presence of Jesus, that that Spirit when he comes, lead them into all truth. In John chapter 14, verse 17, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it sees him not, neither knoweth him. But ye know him, for he dwelleth with you, and shall be in you the spirit of truth. Chapter 15, verse 26. But when the comforter is come, whom I will send to you from the Father, even the spirit of truth. Chapter 16, verse 13. How be it when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you to all truth. For he shall not speak of himself. But whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. Do you understand then the emphasis of having the Holy Ghost on you? It's not falling down on the ground. How many times people fall on the ground? They say they are slain in the spirit, and they go back home. And the sickness that was there before they fell down on the ground, they they pick up the sickness when they rise up. How many times do you find that uh, the people that have epilepsy, you know, while they minister that specializes on this thing, the spirit is fall, uh, that fellow falls now, when he gets up the following day, uh, the epilepsy is still there. How many times you find that the people that, you know, are, you know, in the habit, in the addiction of alcohol and cigarette, you know, they, they come to the meeting, they are slain in the spirit, they fall down, they get up and the following day they pick up their pipes and cigarettes and tobacco and tabac again. How many times do you find that the people that have adultery in their lives, they come to the meeting, they are slain in the spirit, they get up, they go back home, adultery is still there. The emphasis of the Holy Ghost coming upon us is that He is the spirit of truth and He will lead us into all truth. And then it surprises you. How some people that say that they are the Spirit of God, the Spirit of God, when any false doctrine, any error comes into town, they are the first people to take the error. 
How is it that the people that say they have the spirit, the spirit of God, the spirit of truth, when they establish a ministry, a fellowship, and assembly, a church, and the things that are happening in the white garment churches, they bring it to that place. And they keep on speaking in tongues with all the other things coming from the other side. When you really have the spirit of God, it's the spirit of truth. It will sharpen the word of God. It will make you to understand the word of God. I'll show you when I come into how Jesus used that thought. But already now it tells us it is the spirit of truth. In Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3. I'm reading to you there from verse 16. Colossians chapter 3, verse 16. Let the watch of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms, in hymns, and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Well, let that word of God, word of Christ, the Rhema, the word of the Lord, dwell in you richly, and then it will help you to be able to defeat the devil, no matter what direction is coming from. Point number three, defeating Satan with the sword of the Spirit, you will defeat the devil. I said, you will defeat the devil, defeating Satan with the sword of the Spirit. Let me remind you that as we're looking at Ephesians chapter 6, and we know what the battle is all about because it tells us in verse 12, chapter 6, verse 12, for we also not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, against the rulers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Look at this. We also against number one, principalities. Number two, powers. Number three, the rulers of the darkness of this world. Uh, they, they tell you those who have been in that kind of darkness, secret society and cult and all that kind of religion. And they tell you that they, have, they got uh, titles, their positions, their, they know the incantations, they know everything. And then it says, against spiritual wickedness in high places. The question is, how are we able to overcome all these, especially young ministers? Please listen to me. There are many people that are going astray and are going from defeat to defeat because they think there must be a formula whereby if you apply this formula, you will be able to overcome and defeat all the powers of darkness. And so they tell us, if the problem is ancestral speech, this is the page of the prayer book that you are going to read. Read this, and then you are going to overcome the ancestral speech. They say, if it is territorial speech, and that thing is planted, buried in the ground, and it is disturbing your family, they say, this is the page of the prayer. The formula is there. Read it three times or whatever number of times. You will overcome. They say, if it's an incurable disease, and if it just comes up and comes up from generational kind of curse, they say, this is the page you are going to read. If you read this, I'm telling you, you are going to overcome. And then they say, if it is this, if your ministry is going through this, and your family is going through this, and it's uh, this poverty, and it, it, they give formula. But here is this inspired word that you are listening. Against principalities and powers. And Paul, what did it you give us formula? Paul, what did it you you have overcome in your own life? And there is a way you prayed and you overcame. And your weakness, in your weakness, you are strong. And you told us, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Paul, why didn't you help us and put down how you overcame this and overcame this so that we younger ministers who are coming from behind, whenever we go through any problem like that, we just pick up that thing and recite it and read it, and then we overcome. And Paul tells us, no, it's not like that. That's not the way of the Spirit. 
The Spirit will not allow me to do that. What the Spirit has told me to do and what has inspired me to do is to tell you how you will overcome. Tell us then. It says, I'm telling you now. Take unto you the whole armor of God that he may be able to withstand in the evil day and have done all to stand. I heard of a pastor. And that pastor did been doing well, you know, teaching just just, just like, you know, God has revealed in the word, salvation, sanctification, Holy Ghost baptism, faith in the Lord, and promises of God, holding on to the promises, and they've been doing well. But he, he heard that in a particular place that uh, there, there are books of prayer. And those books of prayers, you know, if we read them, well, well you know, they'll have more victory. And so you will get the church together during the service. And while they are praying, you will tell them, close your eyes, close your eyes. Then you will bring it out from the corner where he hid it. And then you will say, say after me. And then we will be reading the thing and they will be saying after him. A, a minister that had the power of God before. Had understanding of the scriptures before. I know that minister. I've listened to him before. Marvelous. Great. Fantastic, effective. But uh, you didn't, you know, many times, some of you ministers, you don't know how great God has made you. You don't know how effective God has made you. It's when we tell you, we who listen to you, we tell you the gift you have, the skill you have, you don't even know you have that skill. But we know, those of us that listen to that uh, preacher, uh, we knew, but he didn't know how great power was invested in him already. And so when he heard that, you know, that if you read this, he went to buy those kinds of books. And then he will be reading to the people, say it after me. He will read, he will read. Then one of the members became inquisitive. So, uh, our pastor was not doing like this before. Say after me, this say after me. This one is too much. So that day, the uh, member, his sister, sat near the front. Close your eyes, close your eyes. They closed their eyes. When he said, say after me, then the sister opened her eyes and saw their beloved pastor reading out of a book. And the sister said, what? So this is what our pastor is doing. And that thing, they began to know about it. And they began to lose the respect and the honor and the anointing. And even the things that happened before, great things that happened before, they do not happen again. And that's the reason you have, you, have, you have it already. You have to conquer the devil. And you are going to conquer. I said you are going to conquer. Yeah. We don't need to go about buying this one, buying this one. Isn't that, you know, yesterday we listened to our great, great bishops. And the other day, well, I, I was sitting on the platform with them. And I happen to, I didn't tell them, maybe they know, I don't know whether they know. My family were our Anglicans. That's not why we invited them, by the way. <laughs> we just invited them because the Lord led us to invite them. I was Anglican, and we used to read from the prayer book. Forgiveness, we will read. This one, we will read. You are going on a journey, we will read. You want to do this, we will read. You want to start a new project? Well, there's there something to read, to read in the prayer book. When we became born again, we dropped all those things. We are not reading again. How is it that after we dropped all those prayer books and we became born again, sanctified, filled with the Holy Ghost, then we go back to pick up prayer book again. And we cannot pray from our heart, flowing out of this special flow, rivers of living water. The sea cannot flow out of our heart again. The prayer coming out of the death, the bottom of your heart. And you know you are pouring out your heart. Pentecostal people will take a book again and be reading, saying you are going to conquer the devil. How do you do that? Here is how to conquer the devil. If you want to conquer the devil, stand there for him. Having your loins girt about your truth. Having on the best plate of righteousness. And your feet shot with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, take on the shield of faith. Wherewith we shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Don't you remember the devil came? 
Jesus at the field of the Holy Ghost. Then the devil came and said, Turn the uh, stone into bread. Jesus brought out the sword, thrust it at him. It is written. And the devil was blown down, caught down. And the devil came again. He took him up. And he said, he has said, he will give the singles charge over you, that uh, they will tell you in their hands, so that you will not dash your foot against the stone. And Jesus said again, it is reaching, that was all. And then he came again, he said, why don't you just bow down? And I will give all this to you. And Jesus said, it is reaching again. He didn't read from a book, he brought out the sword. The sword is in your mouth. I said the sword is in your mouth. Anytime the devil comes, bring out that sword, you will overcome. I said you will overcome. Everyone here, they don't even throw away those books. Throw away those books. Throw away those books. The word of God that is mighty and powerful. You, you are born again. You are sanctified. You are filled with the Holy Ghost. The Spirit is in you. You are in the Spirit. The Word is in you. You are in the Word. The Word is in your mouth. The sword is in your mind. And, and you stand erect and firm with a shield of faith in your hand. And you say, Devil, stop right there. The devil will obey you. Rise up and let us pray. Overcome. You will overcome. You don't need to read it out of a book. See your mouth. Let it come out of your heart. Let it pour out from your heart. The sword of the spirit. The sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Throw away those bare boots. Let the spirit take over. Let the spirit take over. Let the words pour out from your heart. The wrestle against principalities and powers. The wrestle against principalities and powers. And one of the weapons we use, the sword. The sword. The sword. Sword of the spirit. Throw it at the devil. Thrust it at the devil. It is reaching. It is reaching. It is reaching. Be full of the spirit and be full of the word. Be full of the spirit and be full of the word. The sword of the spirit. Which is the word of God. Do you know the appropriate word for the specific problem? When the devil comes to attack your ministry, when the devil comes to attack you in any way, does the spirit of the living God Bring out the exact word, the specific word, the Roman of God. And you thrust it against the devil, against Satan, against the agents of Satan, the word of God, the Roman of God, the, the sword of the spirit. And the devil will flee from you.
Learn the word. Know the word. Memorize the word. Study the word. Believe in the power of that word. Use that word. It's a sword. It's a sword. It's a sword. The sword of the spirit. Use it. Use it. Use it. The sword of the spirit. When they're coming to you. When the enemy rushes in like a mighty flood. When Satan comes in with a great speed. When demons try to attack the church. Or attack your ministry. When confusion tries to invade your mind. Stress, distress, discouragement and doubt. And all the arrows of the enemy have been shot at you. Bring out your sword. Bring out your sword. Bring out your sword. The sword of the spirit, the word of God, and use it effectively. Be skillful. Skillful. Change in using that sword. Know this watch. Know this watch. The secret of victory is to know the world. Know the world. Know the world. Not formula. Not formula. Not formula. Not prayer book. Not prayer book. Not prayer book. Know the world. Believe the world. Study the world. Remember the world. Use it. Use it. Use it. The sword of the spirit which is the word of God. That's how you defeat the enemy. That's how you conquer the enemy. When temptation comes, when the agents of Satan, when they come, when those women, when they come, they don't want to drag you down to their level. Immorality, fornication, adultery. When that temptation is raging, wants you to capture you. Bring out the sword. Use the sword. Use the sword. First it at the devil and let the devil run away from you. The sword of the spirit. The sword of the spirit. The sword of the spirit. Which is the word of God. Usage. Usage. Don't let the devil take that sword from your mouth. Don't let sleep. Laziness, idleness, take this word away from your mouth. Eat that thing. Believe that thing. Accept that thing. Memorize that word. Don't let the devil make you so busy. You have no time to read the word, study the word, believe the word, meditate on the word, memorize the word. And then use it against the devil. Let the devil ever catch you without the sword. Don't let the devil ever catch you anywhere without the sword. Don't go to any place where you cannot carry your sword. 
Don't sleep anywhere where you cannot have the sword. Don't play anywhere where you cannot have the sword. Don't defeat anyone where you cannot have the sword. Don't get yourself into any situation, any environment where you cannot use the sword. The sword of the Spirit, the Word of God. The sword of the Spirit, the Word of God. The sword of the Spirit, the Word of God. Take it with you. Take it with you. Take it with you everywhere you go. Don't befriend anyone that will take the sword away from you. Don't drink anything that will make you forget the sword of the Spirit. Don't eat anything. Don't go to any party where you cannot bring out the sword of the Spirit. Don't get involved in any entertainment, any ceremony, anywhere, anything where you cannot bring out the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God. This is your offensive weapon. This is your offensive weapon. Keep it, keep it, keep it. Make it sharp. Make it sharp. Sharp to edged sword. Usage. That's how Jesus defeated Satan. It is written. He knew the world. He believed the world. He could coach the world. He used it as a sword against Satan. And he overcame. And he overcame. And he overcame. Not formula, not prayer book. The sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Use it and overcome. 